Now you can hear me, right? Yeah, what? <laughs> there we go. We have qu quite the crew up at Juanita Lake, I said, you know, and a lot of them are um, very important and vital to what happens on Sunday morning. So we're glad that they're there. And uh, we, I just got back last night with Doug and Leslie, who are here with their crew to lead worship before us today. So we're excited about the day and uh, just being in the house of the Lord and being able to worship and be, be together. So welcome, welcome. If you are a guest with us, we're glad that you're here. Uh, to worship alongside of us, to, to get to know Jesus more. Uh, if you wouldn't mind taking the uh, little green check-in card out of the, the chair back and fill it out, we'd appreciate that. And you can place it in the offering plate later as it passes. Um, hopefully that happens. I think that's going to happen. And, uh, and we just want to know you're here and be able to visit with you. If you have questions about our church, ways we could serve you, uh, or connect you to ministries, we want to help you do that. So that's how you do that. Uh, if you take a look at your bulletin, uh, we're going to take, take a look at one thing real quick. Uh, watch a video, then we'll go through the rest. But uh, the first thing is, uh, August this month has been set aside as Operation Christmas Child uh, Awareness Month and Emphasis Month. And so we are doing a special offering this entire month, uh, asking you to pray, that we would pray and consider what the Lord might uh, want us to give above and beyond what we already give to church uh, towards Operation Christmas Child. And, uh, and those funds go to help us as a ministry and the, and the folks in our church who are part of that ministry to go buy more supplies and, and to make more boxes. So not only do we want you, uh, when the time comes, to start packing your own boxes uh, as a family, but we'd love for you to consider giving so we can, we can make sure there are more. And usually what happens is they go out and buy those supplies or they order them ahead of time from deep, deep discounted stores where they get great deals. And then we have a big, big packing party here in the sanctuary and pack hundreds of boxes together uh, and just add more, uh, more to the pile. Uh, they, they impact so many lives around the world. So we're going to take a, take a minute right now and uh, watch this video and just uh, kind of get, get the heartstrings a little more. There it is. And we get to be, we get to be part of that. So that is super exciting, right? Um, there are special offering envelopes labeled in the, in the chair racks in front of you. And uh, you can certainly use those if you'd like to give uh, towards Operation Christmas Child. Again, that, we're not giving and just sending that money overseas. We're, we're using that money in our own local ministry. Uh, to, to buy supplies, to pack boxes, to put notes in there from us, uh, to make sure we send as many as we can from here uh, and, and send boxes overseas. So that's, that's what the emphasis is with that. Uh, more information in your bulletin. Um, there uh, is a bookmark in there, to, a, pray, a prayer bookmark. You can check that out, put it in your Bible, and pray this next week uh, as, as uh, through, uh, through that bookmark. All right, a couple other things going on uh, in the bulletin. If you take a look at that, we have a, a women's ministry gathering. Um, coming up on the 24th of August. Uh, that is Saturday, and that's for 10, 10 a.m. here at the church. Uh, so ladies, that's coming up this next week, next Saturday. Um, uh, with the women's stuff too, there's a women's retreat coming up, and that's in October, but signups are going to be now. And so I know Leslie's going to be back at the kiosk today after church. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you're interested in that flyer or getting more information about that women's retreat, uh, you can do that at the kiosk, and she'll let you know more about what's going on, uh, how to sign up for it, what to expect, what the costs are involved with that. Uh, but that's available for you ladies out at the kiosk after the service as well. Um, we have a marriage conference. We talked about this last week. I, I, I know if you were here last week, I, I made a pretty strong plea that, um, and ask, right, that every, everyone that's married, everyone that's married would consider uh, this as an important priority for you and for your, for your family, your, your partner, to be there. And so uh, the dates of that marriage conference are September 20th and 21st. It's a Friday evening. And then uh, come back the next day and have, uh, have just a great time of conversation, some breakout sessions that you can go to that would, uh, we'll have a list of that next week uh, in more detail so you know kind of what, what we're getting into and what to expect from that conference. Um, there is a QR code in your bulletin. So some of you are asking, how do I sign up for this? How do I get involved? How do I do it? It's right there, that QR code. And then uh, next week we'll have a sign up in the lobby as well. But you can use that and fill out that information. Uh, we're trying to make this cost zero for you. So we, we really want you to come and be a part of that. Uh, we, we also understand that it's important for, for uh, a couple to get away. And so if you're a married couple, especially with kids that are still at home, um, and, and maybe you, your child care that you have to figure out is going to be using your home, and you, you, it wouldn't be good to go back home because of the, the distraction there, we want to provide a hotel room for you as well. So uh, that's an option on that, re that reservation as you go register for your, your, uh, yourself and your wife or your, or your husband to let us know that. Uh, we want to make this as easy as possible. Uh, if, there, if it's going to be a really tough thing for you to get child care, um, please let us know. We want to try to work with you on that. Or maybe it's just a tough thing to afford. You have the child care, but it's too, too hard to afford that. Let us know. We want to work with you on that. 
marriages are supremely important, all right? And we want to guard them and protect them, and we want to be proactive towards them way, way, way before it's ever too late. Amen? So please, uh, please, I know it's a big ask, but uh, we, we would want every uh, couple that's married or a individual that's married, maybe your spouse is saying, I'm not going to go to that, everyone to make it a priority if you're a married couple to attend that. Um, we also have coming up, and Alistair said this last week, I, I don't see a flyer in the bulletin, maybe it's one of the kiosks. Uh, starting in September, um, and it's September the 8th, we have a four-week Sunday school emphasis. So Sunday school is kind of doing a mix-up. And so at nine, I'd, I'd really encourage you to come to Sunday school, 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Great opportunity to do some Bible study, but there are some great classes being offered. There's four of them. Uh, you can check those out with, uh, at the kiosk and, and on that flyer. Um, I'm going to be teaching one uh, called Class 101. It's, a, it's one we do usually quarterly, but it's just discovering First Baptist. What do we teach? What do we believe? Why do we believe it? Uh, how can you be part of that ministry? Uh, class 101 is a prerequisite to membership. We want to make sure you, you, you're on board with that uh, philosophy of ministry and on, on board with our, our, uh, our doctrine and theology that we come from Scripture. Um, it's also going to be time, we didn't say this last week, but I'm going to be doing um, and talking about spiritual gifts in that class as well as part of class 101. Um, I know I talked to Jeff earlier. Jeff's going to be doing a class on, uh, on kind of based on the love languages, but kind of using a biblical approach to, to how we communicate well and specifically how we communicate to one another in marriage. You don't have to be married to go to that, but it's, it's going to be kind of more geared uh, towards, towards married folks to just, uh, in, in the way they communicate. Alistair's going to be teaching one on discipleship on, and how do we disciple uh, people within our lives, in our spheres, outside of the church walls. It doesn't have to be a Bible study, but how do I do it personally at the coffee shop or, uh, or as, with my neighbor? So he's going to be leading that. going to be a great class. And then uh, we're, Bubba is going to be teaching one regarding uh, Isaiah and how, how John pulls from Isaiah in John's gospel and how that connects. So um, if you know Bubba, you know it's going to be a deep, good study. So uh, those are the four options. And, and for anyone that's a uh, seventh grader up, is, is encouraged to pick one of those and go and be a part of it and uh, kind of do a fruit basket upset uh, together for those four weeks, all right? So that'll be happening. I've said a lot. There's a lot going on. Uh, check your bulletin for more information and more things going on. Uh, we are going to be having September 8th a, uh, a fellowship potluck uh, or fellowship meal after, after church, uh, and the Fremont team is going to be updating us on, on that trip that just happened, so uh, make sure you're aware of that. Why don't we uh, stand together and uh, as we open our service now with a call to worship, and we're going to be reading out of 1 Samuel chapter 2. I think I'm reading that, unless somebody else was asked. 1 Samuel chapter 2, turn there in my Bible. And 1 through 10. Hannah prayed, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is lifted up by the Lord. My mouth boasts over my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. And there is no rock like our God. Do not boast so proudly or let arrogant words come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and actions are weighed by Him. The bows of the warriors are broken but the feeble are clothed with strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for food, but those who are starving hunger no more. The woman who is childless gives birth to seven, but the woman with many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and gives life. He sends some uh, down to Sheol, and he raises others up. The Lord brings poverty and gives wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the trash heap. He seats them with noblemen and gives them the throne of honor, for the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. He has set the world on them. He guards the steps of, the, of his faithful ones, but the wicked perish in darkness. For a person does not prevail by his own strength. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder in the heavens against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give power to his king, and he will lift up the horn of his anointed one. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we pause to give you all praise and all glory for you alone are worthy. We are thankful that, God, we know that we have a need that is deep, but you are the one who provides for that, that need through the anointed one, through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so we come to honor him and 
we come to remember him and to, and to be thankful for what he has done and for who he is, we, we want to give him proper awe and, and respect and reverence. So God, as we enter this time of worship, may it be an overflow of, of, of hearts that marvel at the wonder and provision of their creator. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. Our children can be dismissed to Children's Church. It's that time, so uh, they can head out and head to either preschool or, or uh, big kid Children's Church. Parents are welcome to take them, and uh, there will be adults out there that will guide the way. They'll join us again after the sermon for uh, more singing time. It would be great. Give it up for these guys. Thank you very much, Cross Purposes. <clears throat> they will be back up here in a jiffy to close us out with some worship. So. That'll be good too. So uh, if you would join me and turn to Psalm 50, you grab a Bible. If you uh, didn't bring one, maybe you don't have one, you can grab one from the rack underneath the chair in front of you or somewhere in front of you uh, and uh, turn with us. And maybe you don't have a Bible at all, but you'd really love to, to have one. Well, we want you to take that home. That's your gift. If you need a Bible, you can take that home with you. So we are in Psalm 50, continuing through the summer uh, of Psalms. And, uh, and we are going to do today, this week and one more week before we get into uh, our September theme. Psalm 50. We've seen a neat uh, progression go through the last several psalms. And, um, and, and today we see this kind of this, almost this culmination as, as God a- arrives now on scene and as, as, as the Lord is calling all his people and kind of wanting, them, wanting to give them this, this pep talk. And so last week we talked about wealth, right, and, and the, the wisdom of wealth and how we should view it and what can and cannot do. And it's not bad to have it, it's bad to depend on it, right? And, and all the while we've seen uh, Israel, God's people, uh, kind of lamenting about their situation with the people coming after them and God becoming this fortress for them. And, and they rise up as this, as, as this people uh, fortified by God and trusting in God under God's wing. And then they, they, we had the instruction uh, about what we should not depend on last week. And again, this week now we see uh, God, Yahweh, shows up and, and has some things to say regarding their worship and how they worship. Uh, we see in Scripture that, uh, that, that judgment begins in the house of the Lord, that we ought to be thinking about how, how do we worship and what, what is our motive of worship and where, where is our heart when we arrive at worship. And I think for many of us, it depends on the day, doesn't it? It depends on, on what happened last night or what happened this morning or what happened in the car ride to church, right? That happens too. I'm not saying it's any of you. Probably more me, right? No. But it's, uh, that's why we take two cars to church. Do you? No. Okay. But we, but we have that, that, we have different places in our heart when we come before the Lord. And, and, and this is not the only place, by the way, that we come to worship, right? We come and gather collectively, corporately together as the body of Christ on a, a Sunday morning or maybe a midweek at some points. But you and I are constantly worshiping. And, and the question is, what, what and how are we worshiping? And so God comes in, in a pretty forceful way and, and lays it out on the line. Uh, the sermon title today is, uh, the, God is the Judge. And maybe some of your translations would even say that uh, over this, the title of this, this passage. Uh, but God as the Judge. And, and the first thing we're going to see as we go through this, we're going to see the, kind of what happens in this progression as the Judge kind of comes into view. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, pray for us that so we'll read our text and then we'll get into it, okay? Well, let's join me in prayer. Father, we are so grateful to be here today. And, and God, uh, I'm, I'm just so thankful for this church family. For so many people with gifts and talents and abilities and God, uh, hearts that are yielding to your spirit. And, and God, we want to be guided by your spirit. We want to be informed by your spirit and led by your spirit. And God, we want to embrace your word for all it has for us, God. And it's living and active. So God, as we, as we stop now, it's not just a uh, checking off the, uh, the next box in the order of service. Um, God, it's, it's centering our hearts and our minds uh, from a point of worship we were just in now to a point of prayer and yielding and God to a point of, of hearing and seeing and being receptive to your word. So we ask for that. We ask that you would, you would show us ourselves clearly through this text. That we would see where we lie and, and God, where we where we need to change or how we need to grow or God, we'd be encouraged by, by the way that we have come. God, because we come from the heart. So God, we, help, we ask that you'd help us. You'd be with us and you'd guide us and you'd direct us. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Psalm 50. I'm going to read it. 
and then we'll get into it. Psalm 50, a psalm of Asaph. The mighty one, God, the Lord, speaks. He summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. From Zion, the perfection of beauty, God appears in radiance. Our God is coming. He will not be silent. Devouring fire precedes him, and a storm rages around him. On high he summons heaven and earth in order to judge his people. Gather my faithful ones to me, those who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God is the judge. Selah. Listen, my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. I am God, your God. I do not rebuke you for your sacrifices or for your burnt offerings, which, you are, con- which are continually before me. I-, I will not take a bull from your households or male goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains uh, and all the creatures of, of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world and everything in it is mine. I do not eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats. Sacrifice a thank offering to God and pay your vows to the Most High. Call on me in a day of trouble. I will rescue you and you will honor me. But God says to the wicked, What right do you have to recite my statutes, to take my covenant on your lips? You hate instruction and fling my words behind you. When you see a thief, you make friends with him, and you sacrifice with adulterers. You unleash your mouth for evil and harness your tongue for deceit. You sit, maligning your brother, slandering your mother's son. You have done these things, and I kept silent, and you thought I was just like you. But I will rebuke you and lay out the case before you. Understand this, you who forget God, or I will tear you apart, and there will be no rescue for you. Whoever sacrifices a thank offering honors me. And whoever orders his conduct, I will show him the salvation of God. This is the word of the Lord. And as we look to this text and as we try to tear it apart and and see what value there is, we see this God as the judge coming. And it's amazing. A lot of the Psalms aren't just God speaking, right? But but the Psalm of Asaph, he's like, this is, thus saith the Lord. And so while we last week were instructed for, you know, in a wisdom psalm, we, it's one of those things we take to heart and like, I need to listen in, I need to pay attention right now. I, I think even, even now more again, we are seeing the word of God and God speaking to us. And so as we look at this, this God as judge, we see three different things we're going to look at today. Number one is this, God is judge. Number one, he summons the earth. He summons the earth. Uh, you can follow along on your sermon notes if you like to. You see the points there and the scriptures I have. Uh, there are discussion questions on the back for you for later individually or collectively, whatever you want in your group. Um, I, I will say this, it was a great time uh, preparing this week, knowing I was going to be at camp most of the time. And, and you know at camp, there's lots of downtime where I'm going to be all by myself where no distra- no, no interruptions, right? It doesn't happen that way. But we had a great time as I kind of culminated the process of this. Uh, uh, yesterday morning, I was sitting down and it was kind of late morning and, and my father-in-law comes over and he sits like, yeah, bring your, bring your sword over. And then Another guy shows up. I'm like, no, you go back and get your sword and come down. And, and then, then another guy comes up. And we, we all sit around the table. I'm like, we're going to go through this sermon. We're going to look through this text. We're going to have this great time back, going back and forth with these, these uh, passages and these scriptures. And, and let's see what the Lord is, is saying to us. And uh, so it was a great time, kind of a, a community effort on this sermon. So it's going to be fun. It's a fun time to do that. Um, I got to see great perspective from them. And it was healthy. And they got to see how, how my train of thought went as we prayed and as we went through the text. So again, number one, God is judge. He summons the earth. What does that mean? He calls us to come. He says, you better, you better come. You better not only listen, you better come. Have you ever had a summons? I hope you didn't have a summons, right? You know that a speeding ticket, it actually what they say at the end, like by signing here, it's not an admission of guilt. It's just a what? Promise to appear in court, right? And what that is is a summons. It's like I'm signing that. I've been summoned to court to answer for this infraction. Right, hopefully you didn't get a summons for some kind of criminal, criminal or civil thing, but maybe you did. There's a summons to come to court, right? Uh, or, or that dreaded thing you get in that mail says, you've been summoned to jury duty, right? And some of us are like, no, never, 
never, I'm never filling out a questionnaire. You know, if you don't fill out the questionnaire, the judge will summon you by, by way of a deputy and bring you to the court to fill it out. So we are summoned, right, to appear. We're summoned to come before the judge, and he summons the earth. We look at verses 1 through 6 here. Again, uh, it says, a psalm of Asaph. He, uh, he was the chief of three song ministers that David put in place in the house of the Lord. Uh, this is a psalm that uh, is penned through the, through the Holy Spirit by him. And he starts out in verse 1. He says, uh, the mighty one, El, as the, as the Hebrew there, uh, God, then he says God, that's Elohim, and then the Lord, that is Yahweh, speaks. Kind of interesting here. He uses three different names of God, right? God, El, is just the powerful one. Uh, Elohim is the creator God, and it's a plural use, usually used in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. And then Yahweh is the personal name of God. It is the self-existent one. So what is Asaph saying here? What is the Lord saying? He says, I, the mighty one, God, the Lord, speaks. I think he's wanting to get our attention. I think he's, it, it's kind of piling on the authority of God there. It's not like the, the, you know, the district one court judge would like to see you now. Or the justice of the peace has a question for you. This is God, the mighty, mighty God, God, the Lord speaks. And it says, he summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the setting. What, what it's saying, it says other places in scripture, basically anyone who the sun touches, that's who he's summoning. Anyone the sun touches, that's who he summons. From Zion, the perfection of beauty, God appears in radiance. He's saying, there's a kingdom and a king, and that's me. And it's perfect and pure, and I'm the one that's summoning you. Our God is coming. It says he will not be silent. Devouring fire precedes him. A storm rages around him. But there, there is judgment to be had. And, 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 and there are things that go astray and awry, and, and we sin. And God comes in judgment. Oftentimes, you'll see it later. We think that, well, God's not watching. God's, God's kind of silent. You know, it's, he's indifferent. I beg to differ. God is not indifferent. And, and as, even if we set aside the picture here of God coming with fire and judgment and wrath, right? And this is just showing that, that it's, it's due, right? Judgment is due on sin, but where do we see that so clearly and so personally and so passionately displayed? As it was poured out from God on the Lord Jesus for you and for me. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that a, a beautiful picture? That's God, the Lord, Elohim, Yahweh. That's the same Lord who, who condescended on earth and took on human flesh. The Lord Adonai, that's another name of God for Jesus now, as he comes and he offers himself as the perfect sacrifice in our place because we desperately, desperately need him. Why? Because we are desperately in need of judgment and discipline. God in his mercy says, I'm coming to you. I'm coming for you. So he comes now in judgment. He summons the earth. And, and so what, what's he going to say? On verse 4, it goes on. He says, he summons heaven and earth, and, and you can look, uh, and he's summoning them as what? As witnesses. And you see this in Deuteronomy. You can do this on your own. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, around verse 23 or so. He, he, there's a covenant made with, with the people of God, and, and he summons then. He brings heaven and earth, right, the, uh, as witnesses. All creation as witnesses. Why? Because they're going to come, and we're going we're gonna to have to pay the piper one day, and when we stand before God, judgment's there, He's going to call those witnesses like uh, all of creation. We all saw what God did. We all saw what was happening there. Well, you think you're alone. You think God's indifferent or far off or can't see. All of creation is watching. And all of creation gives testimony to Yahweh about what is happening in and on the earth. And that's why he, when this covenant was made, it, he brought them heaven and earth to say, you're going to be witnesses into this covenant that I'm making with these people. And so all the earth sees like, wow, there's an amazing God who made a covenant with these, these wayward people. And then they watch, and they, man, these people are really, really wayward. They deserve what they have coming. And, then, and they see, holy cow, they, they see that, that God provided himself as the sacrifice on a cross for our sin. They see that too. And so what should the response of the people be? And that's what he's going to address. So on high, he summons heaven and earth as witnesses in order to judge his people. It says, gather my faithful ones to me, those who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God 
is judge. And there's that Selah. Remember, that's, let it, this sink in. Let it soak into you. And I, I wrote in my notes, like, like, any questions that we have on the authority of God or whether he's a righteous judge or just in the way he views people should be answered here. He is just. The heavens proclaim his righteousness. God is, is a, a, a judge. So we, let that soak in. He is, has absolute authority and absolute rightness and absolute justice within himself. But what's at stake here? Before we get into his, his evidence, and what's at stake? A couple of verses I'll, I'll read here. Uh, and, and I want to I point out that typically when we talk about our relationship with God and wh- how it's going, it's typically a glory issue. You can write that in your notes. This is a glory issue. Whether or not I'm going to get the glory or whether or not God's going to get the glory. That's, that's what our life really comes down to. Am I going to get the glory or is God going to get the glory? And, and giving proper glory and awe and reverence to Him comes from the right perspective of who God is. A proper fear and reverence to God. That's why He says, the Mighty One, God, the Lord speaks. He summons, right? He's going to judge. He's going to gather. The, the heavens proclaim His righteousness that God is judge. We sh- that, should, that should put some awe in us that should put some reverence in us, some respect in us. In Malachi, it says, My name will be great among the nations. So what's at stake here? What is God looking for? He doesn't want your sacrifice. He's like, I don't need that. My name and the glory of God is at stake here, and I want you to take it seriously. My name will be great among the nations. From the rising of the sun to its setting, incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place because my name will be great among the nations as the Lord of armies. He wants his name and his fame to go out. Not just because he's egotistical, but he can be. He's perfectly capable to be the perfect egotistical, uh, prideful guy, God, because he is totally God without any flaw in him at all. But he wants his name to go out so people would see and revere his name and know that by the name of Yahweh, the name of God, he has provided for us in our deepest, deepest need. Again, this is a proper fear of God. Uh, Jesus alludes to this too. What, what's going to happen at the end? Uh, he says in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in all His glory. So again, God is coming. When He comes in all His glory and all the angels with Him, then He, uh, then he will sit on His glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered. Bef- uh, there's a summoning, right? The, the summon to Him. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another as a, as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. It, we're going to be found out. We, we think we can hide and we, we can play, play church or play Christian, and, I, and that's none of us, right? We don't do that. But there, there's a whole society that does, and he's going to speak here to two different groups. One is the faithful ones, and one is the wicked ones. And I, I hope that you aren't in the wicked one. I know I want to be counted as faithful, but man, I know that I I misunderstand what God wants sometimes, and I, I, I misunderstand how he wants me to approach him. And so we want to clear that up. God wants to clear that up. It's about his name. It's about proper, having proper fear and reverence for God, knowing who he is, that he sees the heart, and that he's going to sit and judge that heart and find, was there a heart that was humble towards me, or was there just a life that said, oh, God's this, God's this, but their heart was far from me. They'll separate the sheep from the goats. This has always been it will always be a heart issue. The judge is here and he cannot be fooled. He will find and reveal the true motives of our hearts. So we need to look at him in proper awe and humility with a right reverence that results in proper praise. But it starts with him. It starts with him. Uh, Paul, when he prayed, I want to I, I share this prayer with you. Uh, he, he had this proper understanding. He, he was going about a business for the kingdom of God. He wanted to be about God's business. But his prayer was this. He said, now may the God and Father himself. So his, his focus goes to, the, to God, the Father. May, may he, he himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. So we, we want God to be in charge, he says. We want him himself to be in charge, not us. And may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone, just as we do for you. So he's seeing that this all comes from God. This has to start from God and our response to who God is and have a proper fear and respect for who God is. And then he says, may he make your hearts, may he make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father 
at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. This is a work of God. It starts with God. And sometimes we get that flip, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to do the work necessary. I'm going to put in the time, and God will, God will accept that. That's not how it works. It's not how it goes. God, God has given us himself, and he's extended compassion and grace to us through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And through that faith, he has called us his own. That we're the faithful ones because we put faith in him, the faithful one. People to whom Yahweh has been gracious, that's us, and to whom, whom he's given privileges and unique access and responsibilities are now called to account for their stewardship of that grace. What have we done with that grace? How have we responded uh, from that grace in our worship? And now their hearts are going to be vetted. So that leads us to number two. God is the judge. He confronts and corrects the worshiper. God, as the judge, confronts and corrects the worshiper. If you look at Psalm 50, you go back to verse 7. He says, Listen, my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. I am God, your God. Isn't that great, that personal? I, I, I think about that as a parent. I, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm not just the authority. I'm, I'm your dad. I'm your dad. There are, t- there are times, I've, you've maybe heard this before, but like kids like, hey, can I call you Brandon? Well, that's my name. That's, but it's kind of weird, right? It's like I'm trying to figure out what's the right response. And I heard this one time. You know, for my kids, there are only two people on planet Earth that get to call me dad. I'm your dad. I'm yours. And, and how special it is for the believers in Christ. People who have been grafted into the family of God. God, El, right? God, the, the mighty God, Elohim, Yahweh, our dad. He's your God. Your God. You want to remind them. And he, he goes into verse 8, he says, I do not rebuke you for your sacrifices. I love that. It's like, I don't, I don't want to get all over you. I'm not trying to like rebuke you and say you're horrible. I don't rebuke you for your sacrifices or for your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. He says, I, I see that. I see that you're you're trying. You're continually wanting to be before me. But there's an attitude within your sacrifice that's a little off. So here's, here's what he says. I don't need the bull from your household or male goats from your pen. Why? Because every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and the creatures of the field, they're all mine. So, so what, what are the issues? What are the mistaken assumptions regarding sacrifice? Well, the first mistaken assumption regarding sacrifice was what's the source and who, who's the true owner of said sacrifice? And in some way, they were coming, coming and this, was, this is this historical in, in the world. People thought the gods needed them. People thought that the gods needed to be appeased by them so they would give them something. They'd offer treasure like God didn't have any. They, they'd sacrifice their children as, as though to appease God's anger thinking that that's, that's the only thing that can do it. What, I don't know what kind of God that is, but that's not God. So God, Yahweh, saying, listen, I don't, I don't need your bulls because they ain't yours anyway. They're mine. They're, every animal is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I have all the animals of the earth. It's all mine. Again, remember we talked about this? It has to start with God, not with us. And he gives us stewardship over those animals. He gives us provision in a job or finances. But the question is not, how much of my money should I give to God? The question is, how much of God's money should you keep? Because it's all God's to begin with. And so when you come to it with sacrifice, it can't be like, how much of my money am I giving to God? He needs, he needs a little more. And, and so in some way, they, they were coming thinking, God needed those animals. God will use our faithfulness, but it comes from God first. And then there's another diff- uh, assumption here. The other assumption is that God depends on these animals for his sustenance. It's like it feeds him in some way. And he, he, he says uh, in verse 12, If I were hungry, I would not tell you. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. Uh, the, for the world and everything in it is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or do I drink the blood of goats? No. Right, the, sac- the sacrifices did not bring God something that he lacked. 
But those sacrifices were meant to satisfy his justice against sin by making atonement as a reminder that God is the provision. God forgives through atonement. It was not God who needed sacrifices. It was Israel, and it is us who needs them. And then, the, uh, as far as depending on them for sustenance, uh, God, Yahweh, He is the Creator. His creation does not in any way sustain Him. Do you understand that? Before there was creation, there was God, and He didn't need creation. He sustained in and of Himself. He is the provision. And He is the only one who can provide for us. He's the only one who can sustain us. They misunderstood the meaning of sacrifice. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah, there's lots of these Old Testament prophets that recount this. I, I, I cut about half of them out because it's way too long. Uh, Jeremiah 7, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel says. Again, saying, this is God. He said, add your burnt offerings uh, to your other sacrifices and eat the meat yourselves. He's like, for crying out loud, you just keep stacking meat on top of each other, thinking I'm appeased by that. For when I brought your ancestors out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak with them or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. However, I did give them this command. So what is God looking for? Even in sacrifice, what's he looking for? I gave them this command, obey me, and I will be your God, and you'll be my people. Follow every way that I command so that it may go well with you. Um, yet they didn't listen and pay attention, but they followed their own advice. And, and their own stubbornness and their own evil heart. It's a heart issue, right? It's an issue of the heart. So this needs to be corrected with obedience, and that comes from humility and a proper view of God and fear of God. And this says, then they went backwards and not forwards. And since the day your ancestors came out of the land of Egypt until today, I have sent all my servants and the prophets to you time and time again. And that reminder, folks, was never, you better get a better offering. You better get a better cow. You better spill a little bit more blood on there. That's not quite enough. Why have you turned away from what the God, Lord God says to do? Follow the Lord. Obey Him from your heart. Yield to Him. That's what, that's what all of His servants continually told Him. The heart of obedience is what pleases God. That's what's pleasing to God. Micah 6, verse 6 through 8. Well, then what should I bring before the Lord when, when I come to bow before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings and year-old calves? Would the Lord be pleased with ten thousands of rams, or with thousands of rams, and with ten thousand uh, streams of oil? Or should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the offspring of my body for my own sin? Like, what's going to please God? Would these please God? Verse 8, pretty familiar verse. Mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what it, what it is the Lord requires of you. It's a hard issue, right? What does he say? To act justly, to love mercy or faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. With your God. Listen, the foundation of any sacrifice, the foundation of any service to the Lord is God himself. And we are to first initially come before him as the provision for us, as the everything we need. And then we walk humbly with him. And as we do, we know that he is faithful and he is just. He is faithful and He is just. Who is the faithful one? Who is the just one? It's the Lord Jesus Himself. And Hebrews has a lot to say about the sacrificial system, has a lot to say about the perfect once and done sacrifice, who is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And in verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 15, it says, Therefore, through Him, that is Jesus, through Him, through what He has sacrificed for us, through His atonement, His shed blood, through what He has done for us, through Him, let us, continually offer to God a sacrifice of what? Praise. That is the fruit of lips that confess His name. What is the sacrifice we offer? It's praise. And where does it come from? From the depths of a humble heart, reverent before God, saying, God, You are God and I am not. You are the source of everything. You are the foundation of everything. You have given everything, so we yield to You. Deep faith and deep trust in Him is what is pleasing to God. And that comes from knowing who we are without Him and knowing that He is everything that we need and, and that from what He has done as He's provided for us through the cross, we can have life and forgiveness. And as we, as we have life and forgiveness, it, it wells up inside of us a, a life that wants to be thankful and honoring to the Lord. It, it's, it's this, that this kind of worship 
real worship reflects the truth that we need God. When we sing these songs, I hope you, you get that. Like, I need God. When I bring a sacrifice, it's not because I, he needs my sacrifice. It's because I need it. I need him. Let's switch gears there. Well, let's think, what, so what is the, the application for you and I? If we're the faithful ones who have been called to account, say, listen, you're, you're just misunderstanding this a little bit. You're putting this out of order. We have to reorder it. And, and he, he says it there in, the, uh, in verse, go back with me to verse uh, 14. What's he say? He says, offer a thanksgiving sacrifice to God and pay your vows to the Most High. Obey me. Then he says, call on me in the day of trouble and I will rescue you and you will honor me. You see that praise is thanks, thankfulness for what, he do, what he's done and who he is. And praise becomes that, I'm going to honor you, God. And what, what's honoring to God is us calling on him in our need. He is our rescue. We aren't our own rescue. He is our rescue. So offer him thanksgiving. Thank him for what he's done and for what he's continually going to do. And honor him and say, God, you, you're, you're do everything. Everything belongs to you. And, and, and it's, it's not about my own works or what I've done. It's about what you have done for me. He wants us to get that right. But then he turns his attention, and, and God is a judge, number three. He convicts the hypocrite. He convicts the hypocrite. Look at verse 16. <coughs> but God says to the wicked, What right do you have to recite my statutes and to take my covenant on your lips? You hate instruction and fling my words behind you. When you see a thief, you make friends with him when you so, and you associate with adulterers. You unleash your mouth for evil and harness your tongue for deceit. <clears throat> you sit maligning your brother, slandering your mother's son. You have done these things, and I kept silent, and you thought I was just like you. But I will rebuke you and lay out the case before you. Now, as we look at this, there's a couple things to, to glean here. The wicked are not like the faithful ones. They, they, they don't have this real relationship with God. They haven't come to God and, and embraced his covenant towards them and just kind of gotten off track a little bit. They're the ones who say God things. There's two, two types here, right? The first one are the ones who recite. The second ones are the ones who reject. The ones who recite are the ones who, he, he said, you, you basically, you come to me and you recite my statutes and take, take your covenant upon, or my covenant upon your lips, but you, you have nothing to do with it. You, you, there's nothing in the heart at all regarding it. You really don't believe it. You, how dare you even go that way? They're they're the hypocrites. And Jesus in, the, in his day would say, you're a whitewashed tomb. You try to look good on the outside and recite these Jesus things and God things, but on the inside, your heart is dead and, you, and you're, you're just rotten. Those are the, for the people who recite. Then, then it's the ones who reject. The other ones are just reject, right? He says, uh, you fling my words behind you. You hate instruction and you just fling my words. So some of them recite the words and cling to the words. The other's just like, uh, nope, nope, nope. Don't want any of that. Nope, nope, blah, blah, blah. I don't want it. That's, that's what he's saying. That's who he's addressing. And he's saying, you associate with these adulterers. You unleash evil out of your mouth. <clears throat> every, every evil is coming out of you. So he's going to them because he summoned them. Because this is important, this glory thing, and who God is as, as judge and just and amazing is important not just to those who are covenant keepers with him, his faithful ones. It's important on every living person the, the sun rises on and, and shines on. And so the wicked are included in that. And there's judgment. And I, you know, I can almost say he, he sentences them. And you'll see a sentencing here in a minute. Before we get to that, though, <clears throat> I want us to think about a couple things. Um, first of all, he says, you have done these things, and I kept silent, and you thought I was just like you. Throughout Scripture, we see a lot of that. And what, what we're seeing here happen is this. We, we think that, that we can get away with it. That, again, God's far off. He's not really interested in what's going on. I can hide my actions from him that no one's really paying attention. Well, we know that God is omnipresent and sees everything, so that's, you know, wrong. And we know also now that he summons heaven and earth, all of creation, to testify against us. So everyone, someone's always watching and knows the motive of the heart and how we respond to what God has given us in his creation itself. And we'll see that in a minute. But in Isaiah chapter 29, it says this, The Lord said, These people, these, these people who recite and reject, they, they approach me with their speeches. Here we go. Honor me with their lip service, the reciting, yet their hearts are far from me. And human rules are all that, all that direct their worship of me. Therefore, I'll again confound these people and, and with wonder after wonder and 
The wisdom of the wise will vanish, and the perception of the perceptive will be hidden. That they won't be able to figure it out. They think they're wise, but they're not. And then verse 15, woe to those who go to great lengths to hide their plans from God. So here's the hiders, right? The first ones were the reciters, here's the rejectors, to hide their plans for God. Uh, they do their works in the dark and say, who sees us? Who knows us? You have turned things around as if the potter were the same as the clay. How can, that, uh, how can what is made say about the maker, he didn't make me? How can what is formed say about the one who formed him, he doesn't understand what he's doing? This is God judging the wicked, saying, you don't have a clue. You think you're wise, but you're not wise. So, so we have to understand there's judgment for that. That's why there's judgment against this. Romans, Paul tells us this in Romans 1. God's wrath is revealed against heaven, uh, against all ungodlessness uh, and, and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. Right? There goes wisdom, there goes truth. They reject that, that notion. Uh, since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. So we know about what we need to know about God because God's shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world being understood through what has been made. Like God is, God is amazing. He is revealing himself to us in the world, everyone the sun rises on, through the sun rising and through the trees reaching up to heaven and through these amazing mountains and snow-covered peaks. He's revealing himself in creation to a people, but they are rejecting him. As a result, though, because of the creation, people are without excuse. They can't stand and say, I, I didn't know. God said, no, I revealed myself to you. And creation is here as a, test, as a, as a witness to give testimony against you. It says, for though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. So what do they do? In, the, in suppression of the truth and running away and rejecting Christ, they are not glorifying him, giving him honor, and they're not showing gratitude, right? Being thankful in their heart. Aren't those the two things that God is dealing with, with Israel and with us? Shouldn't, isn't there, doesn't he want us to honor him as God and to be thankful, like offer sacrifices of thanksgiving? That's what we're dealing with, those two things. So when we reject God, it, it ends up in not showing honor and to God and not showing gratitude to God. Instead, <clears throat> our thinking becomes worthless. So how do we get wise? How do we get wise when we want to run away from the only one who gives wisdom <clears throat> and find it in other things? We don't. Job talked about this. Job 28. Says, where, where can wisdom be found and where is understanding located? No one can know its value since it cannot be found in the land of the living. The ocean depths say, it's not in me. The sea, the sea declares, I, I don't have it. Gold cannot be exchanged for it, and silver cannot be weighed out for its price. It goes on. But God, God understands the way to wisdom, and he knows its location, for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. And when God fixed the weight of the wind and distributed the waters by measure, when he established a limit for the rain and a path for the lightning, he considered wisdom and he evaluated it. He established it and he exclaimed it. He said to mankind, this is it. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn from evil is understanding. We, we, we are to turn to him for wisdom. And, and that, that can't be that we continue to resist him or, or give lip service. So if you're in that category of the wicked, you're not, you're not a faithful one. You're just like, I'll just give lip service. And usually the lip service people are the ones at church, the ones that reject don't come, right? But sometimes you, you, you're here and you're like, I, I've, I've kind of been going through the motions. You, you don't have proper wisdom. You don't have proper fear of God and, and, and understanding, and it comes from Him. And the wisdom is this. You need Him. Trust in Him. Let Him be your God. Let the God of the universe be your God, be your Father, Let, that you can call Him Dad. Look at what the sentence, the sentence comes up here. In, in back to Psalm 50, look at verse 22. He's going to say a sentence. Understand this. Now, we just talked about where understanding comes from, right? He says, understand this, you who forget God, or I'll tear you apart, and there will be no rescue for you. I, you don't want to be on the business end of that. I'm just saying you don't want to be. 
And, and as you, know, you read a psalm like this, it's like, well, what are we going to see? God's going to just pound them dead. But here, the judge of the entire cosmos, who summoned everyone to himself to give an account, who dealt with the faithful ones and says, listen, remember, I don't need anything from you. You need me, so just give me thanksgiving and honor. Then deals with the wicked. And what does he say? He says, you're wicked. And, and I would expect, you're wicked, and I'm done with you. I'm going to kill you all. You're done. But he gives them this, this mercy. Look, look, carry on. Understand this. So first off, he's like, I want you to understand this. I want your heart to open up and to see that what you believe is not accurate. How you live is a fallacy. It's false. Understand this, O oh, you who forget God. Understand that you're forgetting God and you need not to do that. Remember him, or I will tear you apart. There's the sentence, and there's no rescue for you. But look what he says in verse 23. Whoever, I think about Romans, right? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, what? Will be saved. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And here in Psalm 50, 23, he says, Whoever offers a thanksgiving sacrifice honors me. And whoever orders his conduct, I will show him the salvation of God. Now, let me, let me clarify here. It doesn't mean you have to get your conduct in order. Like you have to be a good person squared away. What it is is yielding. What does the Lord require of you? Act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's a humble heart that says, God, I, I need you. I want to submit to you. What does the Lord require? Just obey me. Follow me. Let me be your God. I, I love this about God. I, as we look at this psalm, I love how, how there's this righteous judge. He's like, he's going after it. And then he gives us, us his, his faithful ones, like this little like, hey, I, I love you. Kind of square things away a little bit. This is what, first things first. Then he goes to the wicked. We're like, yeah, it's, it's on. And he gives them an out. It says, even you, the wicked, who maybe recite but don't really believe, or maybe you just reject me altogether, even you, the wicked, can, can really yield your heart to me. Even you, the wicked, can find salvation and rescue. But it takes knowing God. It takes knowing and fearing God. And as we fear God, that fear leads to repentance. And that fear and that repentance then leads to this hope and this salvation. And that, that calls for then thanksgiving to pour out of our heart and honor to pour out of our heart. And that's what the Lord wants from us. That's what's pleasing to Him. That's what the judge says. Amen? I'm going to ask our worship team to come on back up and get set up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and pray for us. Our children are going to be coming back in in a minute to join us together in worship. So I, just, I, would, I would say a couple things. One, as they come back up and, and as they start to play, um, just if you need a time to reflect on this and to think through it and to pray, do that. This is a time for us to respond to the heart of God that he's, and to the Spirit of God through the Word of God. So do that. Use this time as a time to respond. And then as they begin to play and sing and, and God, as, they, as they lead us in worship, that, that we would, these, these worship songs would be songs of remembering who God is and our great need for Him. And they would be songs that, that help us offer thanksgiving to Him and honor to him. Not because he needs you to sing today, like he's deficient in some way. He's not. But he wants to know that he's your God and that all honor and all glory and all thanksgiving will pour out of our hearts to him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, you are, you are worthy to be praised. We thank you for that. We thank you that you are so merciful and compassionate and you're patient with us. Oh man, you're patient with us. God, help us now as we respond, that, God, we respond to this correction or, God, to this conviction that you've, you've brought upon our hearts. That, God, we would yield to you. We would see who you are in proper reverence and fear. That we would respond to you, not because you need something, but because, God, what pleases you, though, is, is faith. What pleases you is, is honor. What pleases you is a heart that overflows with thanksgiving because of who you are. We thank you for all you've done for us. We offer ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.